So now we're going to talk about the different types of neural networks. Obviously, there are many different types of neural networks out there. But what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about some of the most basic types. And then we're going to move on to discuss about some really cool applications and some special neural network architectures that have been developed for those applications. So the most basic type of neural network is the simple feed forward neural network. So neural networks traditionally since the 80s, they had three or four layers. So there was an input layer, an output layer, and then one or two hidden layers. Funnily enough, before deep learning came along, it was an open debate whether having two hidden layers would offer an advantage over one hidden layer. So here we just have the input. Uh, in the output layer, you can have one or multiple nodes. Uh, so obviously you have one node when you have something like binary classification or regression. You have multiple nodes when you have a multi-class classification problem or sometimes when you have a multi-regression problem. And deep learning, in this case, deep neural networks, simply extend the original concept of simple neural networks to accommodate more layers. Deep learning proved that it's actually very beneficial to have multiple layers, more than two. But the issue that existed in the previous decades is that, first of all, we didn't have enough data to train these networks. And secondly, there was an issue with the optimization techniques that were being used at that time, and it made it very difficult to train these networks. So recurrent neural networks uh, add an extra layer of complexity. Okay, so in a recurrent neural network, you have a neural network where a layer can feed the output back to a previous layer. Okay, so you have a signal that feeds back into itself. And why is this a very powerful concept? I mean, it's very complicated, but why would anyone want to do this? So the reason that someone would want to do this is because it allows for long-term dependencies. It allows for memory. And there are domains where memory is very important. So there are obviously different kinds of recurrent connections. You can have one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, many-to-many, etc. And um, we'll see right now how this is used. So what are some domains where memory is important? Two things that quickly pop in mind is natural language and time series. Right? So if we look in this um, graph again, we, we saw earlier how, using, how we can uh, translate from one language to another by using two networks, an encoder and a decoder network. So this is a recurrent architecture, right? So in this case, we have a many-to-many -many recurrent architecture. Why? Because you have many words that go in you have many words that go out. And you need to keep a memory of the phrase being translated in order to translate it successfully. The context of a phrase is important for translating a single word. Let's say that you work in finance, okay, another example. And you're going to predict the price of a stock on the stock exchange, right? So one way to do that is you can feed many variables. Anything you believe might influence the price of a stock, right? From the GDP of a country to other factors, other stocks. You can fit this into a recurrent architecture, and then you want to predict a single value. So you have a many-to-one, um, you have a many-to-one relationship. And why you want to use a recurrent architecture in this case? Well, the reason you want to do that is because memory in this context can be very important. Using a recurrent neural network can allow you to extract patterns which you might not have been able to extract by using simply feed-forward neural networks. Since the simple recurrent units, there have been some other advances in this front. The most notable one is the long short-term memory unit. You can see on this image here how much more complicated it is than simply recurrent units. The main advantage of this unit is that it can actually allow for longer dependencies, which means that whereas recurrent units might have been able to look into, let's say, the two or three previous words using an LSTM block, you can look into the previous 10 or 20 words. And then there have been some other advances, such as gated recurrent units, which is a simplification of the LSTM unit. So this is, again, the example as to why machine translation uses recurrent neural networks. So the encoder, the coder network, which is later was later called the sequence-to-sequence -sequence network, is a many-to-many -many architecture, as I mentioned. And you can see here a very good example of this image, how the sentence, I am a student in English, is translated into French. Okay, the same sentence, just you know, yeah. And you can see that in this image, every rectangle is a node. And you can see how the nodes feed not only forward, like a standard feed forward architecture, but also feed to each other. That's enabling the network to 
keep track of the context. Uh, so in this architecture, you can see that I have two hidden layers. In practice, actual neural networks implemented, they can have many, many recurrent layers. And some of these recurrent layers can fit to the previous layer or many layers before them. A recurrent neural networks can be very complicated, but the reason that are being used is that even though they're complicated, they're also very effective.